fine. I just. Ça marche, il faut que ce soit euh, rouge. Nous allons commencer. 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 Nous And uh, as you know, this is the final fireworks for a week long of uh, intensive discussions on cosmology. So the, this, is not, this is a crowning achievement that we'll be talking about, but the field keeps going. And so that's what we've been discussing for the week. And it's, it seemed fit uh, that this uh, would be the concluding act. So I'm very happy to welcome you all. And uh, now I think this is time for the official part to get started. But welcome uh, in, the I, in the IAP. Thank you, Dr. Boucher. I was hoping I'd get to hide behind the podium, but apparently I'm, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, we're excited to be here in Paris, even with the heat wave, and to be part of the Cosmo Gold Conference. So thank you all for being here with us. Um, the Gruber International Prize Program, established in 2000, recognizes achievements and discoveries that produce fundamental shifts in human knowledge and culture. While we are here to honor Nicholas Kaiser and Joseph Silk, let me mention that they joined Bert Vogelstein and Joseph Takahashi on our 2019 roster. Please note that nominations to the 2020 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15, 2019 and that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to cosmology, I simply must acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the International Prize Program and whose force, uh, attention in doing so uh, brought our affiliation with the International Astronomical Union um, and gave us the legs to stand on our own. The Cosmology Prize is presented in conjunction with the IAU, a partnership that has guided our efforts since the earliest days. It's my pleasure now to introduce their General Secretary, Teresa Lago, who will say a few words about this fruitful collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you, even with the whole heat. So, I, like that? Okay. IAU is uh, pleased to have collaborated with the Group of Cosmology Prize since the prize started in 2000, it was mentioned. Uh, the IAU has an advisory role in the constitution of the selection advisory board. And as part of this collaboration, we received an annual uh, grant of $50,000 to be awarded to postdoctoral fellows from around the world so that they may, may pursue their education and research in the excellent Uh, sites in their fields. The Gruber Fellowship uh, Award has been uh, given to young scientists from many countries, a wide range of countries, from Algeria to Chile, Poland, Taiwan, and so on. I will not name them. In some years, the award goes to one young uh, researcher, but in other years, like 2019, the selection is so difficult that we uh, end up dividing the work between two excellent uh, junior um, researchers. And uh, the fact that, 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 that also happened in 2019 is interesting because it adds up 
two new countries to the list of uh, the 15 or more countries. And the new countries are Ukraine and France. So the Gruber, the 2019 Gruber Fellowships, Fellows, or Fellowships go to Valeria Korol from Ukraine and to Martin Turbet from France. Valerie has just finished her PhD uh, in uh, astrophysics at the University of Leiden. She said she will finish by June, so I, I believe she has finished by now. And for the next three years, she will have a postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute of, for Gravitational Waves Astronomy at the University of Birmingham in the UK. The winning proposal she submitted to the Gruber, Gruber Foundation Fellowship is very challenging. She's going to use gravitational waves emitted by ultra-compact object uh, uh, systems in the, to explore the Milky Way and its neighborhood. But even more interesting, she proposes to exploit further the gravitational wave signals, uh, transforming them into music signals and combining them with visual art for outreach activities. Martin Turbat has concluded his PhD in uh, astronomy and astrophysics at Sorbonne University in September 2018. He has recently won the prize for the second best thesis in geophysics in France. He has a Marie Curie fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship to work at the Geneva Observatory for the future. And his winning proposal uh, to the Gruber Foundation Fellowship is about using three-dimensional global cl climate models to study the atmospheres of terrestrial-sized planets in the solar system and in other external systems. This is very challenging to, as well because it does not propose to wait for the big telescopes coming in a relatively short future. He wants to identify the current observations obtained with the currently used working telescopes uh, so that to identify those observations that may lead to the first characterization of the atmosphere of exoplanets capable of testing the existence of life. I wish both a very successful career. Thank you, Dr. Lago, for being here today. Our relationship with the IAU is invaluable. Nick Kaiser and Joseph Silk were chosen for the 2019 prize by a distinguished selection advisory board that was nominated by the IAU and its affiliate organizations. We sincerely appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that the advisors bring to the judging process. Let me now invite a member of that board Subir Sarkar to present the official citation and introduce the scientific accomplishments of our recipients. Good evening. So I have the honor of presenting the citation on behalf of the Gruber Prize Committee. So the Gruber Foundation is pleased to present the 2019 Cosmology Prize to Nicholas Kaiser and Joseph Silk for their seminal contributions to the theory of cosmological structure formation and probes of dark matter, Kaiser provided the mathematical description of primordial density fluctuations that have evolved into large-scale structure, while Silk predicted the eponymous damping scale imprinted on the cosmic microwave background anisotropies. Kaiser pioneered the analysis of weak gravitational lensing of light from distant galaxies by dark matter while Silk recognized dark matter's indirect signatures, such as antiprotons in cosmic rays and high energy neutrinos from the sun, their work has transformed modern cosmology. Now that's what we said in the press release, so now please allow me to make a few remarks appropriate for this expert audience of cosmologists. So Peter Gruber, who with Patricia Gruber founded the uh, the Gruber Foundation, which awards these prizes, he uh, believed that cosmology is the most scientifically rigorous and aesthetically elegant and the most poetic of the sciences. Now, I presume all of us in this room quite agree with that. We are not going to object to this characterization of what we do. 
But uh, I can also, I think, depend upon all of you uh, agreeing that our distinguished awardees today have indeed made what the prize is awarded for, namely theoretical, analytical, conceptual, or observational discoveries uh, that lead to fundamental advances in our understanding of the universe. They have indeed revolutionized modern cosmology with contributions to two of its key topics, uh, dark matter and the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure. And this conference, which um, I had the pleasure of joining the last part of, uh, has been devoted to a critical assessment of precisely what has been happening in this golden age of cosmology for the last 10-15 uh, years. And it's a celebration of the major advances that have taken place and that many of you have contributed to and certainly all of us have shared in. So I think uh, it is a fitting end to this meeting to celebrate the pioneering contributions by our awardees which have contributed so much to these successes. So we'll save the personal anecdotes about their lives and careers for the dinner, but for now, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. So may I now, yeah. May I now uh, call upon Nicholas Kaiser and Joseph Silk to please come forward to receive your prizes. Greeted by having um, marvelous graduate students, incredible postdocs, um, and I seem to think that Nick might even be one of those, and incredible colleagues. And over the years, I would say um, they all, uh, without them, I don't think I would have gotten very far at all. And it's been a wonderful um, effort over the years to, uh, to do cosmology with this great team of people. Is that working? You can hear me? Good. Okay, let me just switch this on. First off, I'd like to... Put it in your pocket. Yeah. I, I'd like to dedicate this to a few people, two of my uh, late mum and dad, who uh, supported me when I was uh, 
not quite sure what I wanted to do as a young man and tried to do some crazy things, but then finally came back to the, uh, the correct path for me, which I think was to do physics. I'd also like to, uh, uh, to, to dedicate this to my first real physics teacher, Keith Atkin, when I went back to college to do my uh, A-levels, the matriculation exams in, uh, uh, that I should have done at high school. He, he just really inspired me. He asked me one day, what do I want to do in my life? I said, I want your job. You know, and, uh, <laughs> but but the, other, the other parent is Martin Rees, who I was lucky enough to have as a supervisor. And, and like many of his uh, ex-PhD students, later on in my career, I would so often reach a point where I'd just finished some great piece of work, and then it would occur to me, oh, that's what Martin was talking about, <laughs> you know, when I, I didn't fully understand it. Anyway, so, so uh, let, let me uh, commence with this, uh, this short uh, presentation. Um, on uh, testing cosmology, which is uh, what, what I got this gorgeous uh, uh, award for. So I think what I'll do is, is give a, a brief historical sketch of, of how we got here, and then say a few words about um, these observational tests that we use, being shamelessly um, advertising my own role in this, so you must understand uh, this is only relatively small. And then say a few things about where I think we are, the, the, the current status uh, uh, and problems, and what's the, what's the outlook. I better check the time. So um, this is a picture that cosmologists nearly always show these days, which is very busy and has a lot of things um, going on in it. It's supposed to represent the model now in which we have four phases of the universe. So this all got started, I would say, modern cosmology in the 20s, so just under 100 years ago, when Hubble and others discovered to their great surprise that we live in this universe full of galaxies and it's expanding. So a, a, a huge revolution. Right after that, Zwicky discovered dark matter in, in 35, right? incredibly uh, early on. He was l looking at, at a cluster of famous cluster of galaxies, more on these clusters later. And things sort of settled down for a while. Alan Sandage famously characterized cosmology as the search for two numbers. That's what he worked on, which is the two numbers being how fast the universe was expanding and how fast that was slowing down because of all all the matter in it. Though it seems to me that, that sort of short changes the subject because the 800 pound gorilla in the room was what is all this dark matter, right? Uh, that comes later. So the next big discovery had to wait until 65 when these gentlemen discovered the cosmic microwave background. This meeting this week has been mostly about that and what this microwave background is, it's radiation, it's not particularly important for the, the evolution of the universe now, but it was super important in the past. Right? And it's a fossil of the early universe. And from this radiation, we get a snapshot of the, of the universe as it was about 400,000 years after the, the Big Bang. Now we're at, the, we're at about 10 billion years uh, after the Big Bang. And this is the famous Planck image, what we're seeing here for the non-specialists is, is um, the tiny, tiny fluctuations in the brightness of this radiation. It's almost completely isotropic, but these little one part in a hundred thousand fluctuations uh, are critical for the story that's now going to unfold. What this gave us, though, in, in 65 was the hot Big Bang model that the universe had been very hot radiation dominated in the past and was, was, was now uh, matter dominated. And physicists in the 70s realized that from that you could calculate how nuclear reactions would have happened in the first three minutes. That was the title uh, of Steven Weinberg's famous popular 
book at the, at the time. And amazingly, they could predict that the universe now, or uh, before uh, stars started burning, would be 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. And guess what? That was exactly right. It explained the composition of, of uh, the stars around us. I really wanted to emphasize this, because we're always trying to push the latest, greatest, crazy idea, right? And, and I think we give a lot of people non-cosmologists, the impression that it's just a fairy story, right? And um, this part of the story is not a fairy story at all. Cosmologists in the 70s could claim quite justifiably that they understood the history of the universe from when it was about a second old to its current age, 17 orders of magnitude. Now, this just gave them confidence to go ahead, and that's where the fairy story starts. But uh, I just want to say that this was, this was uh, uh, solid stuff. The other interesting thing they found is that this works in detail only if the amount of normal matter is quite small, and smaller than the amount of dark matter that Zwicky had found. So this is the first indication, which became really solid much later, that the dark matter is something totally uh, mysterious. So the Big Bang was a very good working model. Cosmologists used it as a framework for interpreting their observations, but it had some problems to do with its origin. And we called these the flatness problem, the age problem, uh, and the horizon problem. They all stem from one thing, which is that according to the conventional wisdom, for any sensible composition, of the universe, the universe's expansion would be slowing down. And this was a big problem. Right, so what happened next was a revolution. In 1979, um, the scalar field from particle physics came, came to the rescue. The particle physicists had developed the standard model for, of particle physics in the middle, mid 20th century. And critical to that was this Higgs field that, that the God particle, uh, 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 as some people uh, have dubbed it. And this was involved in unifying the weak nuclear force and electromagnetism. At the same time, these particle physicists were mostly believing that at a, much, uh, at a very early time in the universe, when the universe was super hot, there had been what was called grand unification. Right? And it was in 79 when Alan Guth was attending a talk by a cosmologist called Bob Dickey, who was talking about the great triumphs of the Big Bang, but emphasized the problems that Guth apparently realized during this talk that he had the solution. He was working on grand unification. He realized that if at the time of grand unification, part of the universe became dominated by a scalar field, a bit like the, the Higgs field, then it could start to speed up it, its expansion. This is an amazing uh, theory, which is, gives the, um, creates all of the matter in the universe out of nothing, and explains how the Big Bang gets started. Right? This, is, this is the answer to the question, what happens before uh, the, the Big Bang? Right? And it makes uh, some interesting predictions. Of 79, in 82, the Nuffield workshop happened, which brought together all the great big shots in cosmology to fill in the final part of this theory, which was not only to explain the origin of the universe and all its matter, they argued that if the universe was as smooth as it could be, but had the minimal fluctuations implied by quantum mechanics, you could explain not only why the universe is big and old and full of stuff, but where all the seeds for structure came from. And I think of this as a revolution. And for me, it was important because that's when I was a graduate student at Cambridge. And George, who's here somewhere, drove me over early one morning to go to the, the, this famous meeting. And I've spent you know, a great deal of my career trying to uh, confront this kind of theory with observational tests. So in the 80s and 90s, it was wild times. At first, we had a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities seemed open. Sadly, along the way, many of them got ruled out by observations. Hot dark matter died. Cosmic strings were a 
nice idea. Those got killed uh, by observations, and this cold dark matter model uh, came to dominate. Problem with that, however, was that inflation says that omega is equal to one. That's a measure of how much matter there is in the universe. And stubbornly, the data refused to allow that, that the amount of matter seems to be about 30% uh, of that. So what, there were various other problems that, that people pointed out. And it really gelled. They can probably hear me anyway. Round about the end of the millennium with two things. One was the measurement of the, of the expansion rate of the universe uh, from supernovae and the WMAP CMB observations. One showed that the, the expansion of the universe is speeding up now. The universe is starting to inflate again. Right? And the other one showed that the universe really is spatially flat. Omega has to be equal to exactly one. And so we were missing something, the 70%, and that's what we call uh, the dark energy. So what are the observational tests? Um, one comes from this, the cosmic microwave background. You see some small-scale features, and you see some large-scale features. And the large-scale features tell us that the basic prediction of the spectrum of fluctuations from inflation is, is correct, that, it, that it's scale invariant. My um, role in this was to look at much smaller perturbations. Martin said, you should think about polarization. So it didn't mean much to me, but after reading uh, a textbook, I went away uh, and ca calculated it. And that's about when I got my PhD. Now, at that time, these fluctuations had not been measured. Right? They were a long way from being measurable. And the polarization I'd calculated was a factor five times smaller. And so I concluded that it was time to switch gears and move, move into a, a different way of testing it. So I started working on galaxy clustering. This is a beautiful picture of a simulation showing how structure evolves uh, and forms something called the cosmic web. Uh, in the universe. Massive simulation, what, so it's zooming in on this little region down there where you're seeing a big, what is supposed to be a big uh, cluster of galaxies. And here's some observations of the actual cosmic web in our actual universe, and it looks just like uh, what we see. So the person who had defined the program here was Jim Peebles. Jim said, we got to measure statistical properties of this distribution, the two-point function, the three-point function. He showed how we could use that in the cosmic virial theorem to get the density uh, of uh, the universe. A big problem that he thought was a, a killer problem for the standard model was the clustering of these clusters themselves. Right, objects like this. These were, turned out to be very strongly clustered, and he said, we, we need some very strange initial conditions. And my contribution in 84 was to show, no, it's very easy to explain uh, that clustering in the, in the standard uh, model. What that led to, were some excitement, on my part anyway, was the idea, well, wait a minute, maybe the galaxies are strongly biased in their clustering too. And the hope was that we could somehow get around the fact that the universe didn't look like it only had 30% of the critical density. We wanted it to be 100%, and that turned out to be uh, a dead end. Um, let's see. At the, about the same time, um, oh, mu mustn't forget this. So again, on, on, on galaxy clustering, one thing that, that I realized in 87 is that when we look at this, this is a three-dimensional picture of a slice of the universe, right? It's pizza pie shaped, but the radial dimension, how do we get the, the third dimension in cosmology? How are we getting the distance to these distant galaxies. We don't have any tape measure or anything. What we're doing is using the redshift, which 
we know that the more distant objects, the, the objects that have higher redshifts are more distant, and the ones with low redshift are nearer by. That's what Hubble did, and so on. Well, it's true on the, largest, on the large scale here, but whenever you look at actual structures, the superclusters here, they're going to be distorted, and the reason for that is because this structure isn't static, it's growing with time. So the, the, the matter's flowing into these uh, superclusters. And so redshift isn't a, isn't a faithful measure of distance. And this is, the effect is called redshift space distortion. From that, you can measure how fast the structure's evolving. And at the time, we used that to try and figure out what the density of the universe is in matter. Now we, we use it to, uh, uh, our colleagues use it to measure the amount of dark energy and so on. Anything that affects the growth rate of structure. So that's two probes, CMB galaxy clustering. Back in Cambridge, our professor Donald Lyndon Bell had thrown his lot in with um, six others to become the seven samurai, uh, late 70s, and they, were, they thought they were looking at the structure of elliptical galaxies, but as often happens, what they discovered was something unexpected, was that they could measure the expansion of the universe in the local uni universe, and found it wasn't expanding homogeneously, it looked as though there was a tidal field, and they said, aha, there's a great attractor sitting over there, uh, inconveniently hidden in the galactic plane that was pulling us. Uh, this was very exciting, and I asked Donald if I could have a look at the data and calculate. I said, I want to calculate the likelihood, Donald. And after bugging him a few times, he gave me the data. Unfortunately, he'd forgotten to tell his collaborators. So when I presented the results to them at their group meeting, there was a rather embarrassed silence when everyone looked at Donald and said, how did Nick get our data? <laughs> right? So that was interesting. And another thing that happened at the time which was this idea of using likelihood. All optical astronomers were using frequentist statistics. Chi-squared was normally about as sophisticated uh, as it got, and it had some problems, and so we proposed, you know, let's plot likelihood contours, likelihood functions. And it's kind of weird, we got shouted at by some people who didn't like to throw out the old way of doing things, but it's kind of worrying now that at a meeting like this, everyone is an evangelical Bayesian. Right? There is not a frequentist, there's no card-carrying frequentist left in, in cosmology, and I'm not sure that that's healthy. Then the last, the fourth probe, is gravitational lensing, sort of sketched in this cartoon, that the light we see from distant galaxies has got to us by a slightly circuitous route. And so when we look at the distant galaxies, we don't see them as we should see them. They're distorted by something a bit like a, a, a mirage, a gravitational mirage. Tony Tyson pioneered this around about 1990. He showed that you could measure, actually measure this distortion uh, with real observational telescopes. And this just led to a huge amount of of excitement uh, and trying to understand what is it he's actually measured. Uh, and so I got heavily uh, involved in that. So where do we stand uh, today? Well, the, the positive things is that this, what we end up with is Lambda CDM model, which seems to work exceptionally well. This is theory versus data for, from the CMB. It's just it, embarrassingly good. Here's galaxy clustering, right, where up on the, the north and the west are observations, two different surveys, three actually, and on the right in red, if you're not colorblind, is the simulations. It's a, it looks ju just incredibly good, and statistically it, it, it agrees as well. What, what are the cons? Well, we've got a lot of questions. What is the dark matter? We don't know what that is. What is the dark energy? Even less. 
do we know what it is? And maybe the, the same question may well be, what is the density of the vacuum in, the un, in, in physics? Right? That, that, that's not known. Physicists aren't able to answer that simple question. Why are they, do these two components, dark matter and dark energy, have very similar densities today? Because that wasn't the, the case all of the time. It seems to be coincidental. There's various other things. It's like there are neutrinos have a mass, and that mass has just become important, really. We don't know why there's actually more matter than antimatter in the universe. A bunch of things which, you know, we, we forget about when we're doing day-to-day -day testing of the cosmological theory. These are big, uh, Im important uh, questions. So I'd say that, that a meta question is, are these problems really, in fact, reflecting one single problem, right? You know, Occam's razor said you should search for the most efficient hypothesis to explain things, right? So rather than coming up with a solution for the dark matter and a solution for the dark energy, say, wouldn't it be nice if we could get a, a common solution? I think that drives a, a lot of people. And, you know, that, that's, you know, Occam would say that's good, and it sort of fits with the idea that the history of physics on the broad scale has been discovery of phenomena and their unification. You know, Newton unified the way an apple falls with the moon's orbit around the Earth. Maxwell in the, in the 19th century unified electricity and, and magnetism. 20th century, the unification of, of that with the Electra week. So it would be lovely, surely, to have a theory that in a unified way explained all of these problems at a stroke. Maybe, I, just, I don't know. But history teaches us it's not always like that. Newton's theory of gravity had to be replaced because it failed in two ways in the solar system, the inner planet and the outermost planets. But it failed for two different reasons. One was dark matter, and the other one was that you needed a new theory. So I don't know. The, the jury, or at least I, I, I don't have a, a strong opinion there. So what's the outlook for the next decade? Well, it will be a golden age. Well, it, these instruments I'm showing here are worth their weight in gold, literally, uh, at least the, the satellites. Uh, and um, we are going to have some amazing toys to push forward the kind of observations that I've reviewed well beyond what we thought was ever going to be possible back in the, the 80s and 90s, Euclid will do lensing, so will LSST, galaxy clustering. Square kilometre array is a bit further off, but there are already um, precursors to that that, that, are, that are starting to operate now. So, and there will be CMB, the Japanese have just confirmed Lightbird. So what can we expect? The pessimistic view is that everything will fit with Lambda CDM. Right? In the jargon that we will, sh the, the tensions which we have at the moment will, will be found to be observational error, will go away, everything will be consistent, and W will be equal to minus 1.0000, uh, uh, and it is just Einstein's cosmological constant. And cosmology will become a lot like, you know, in the 40s, 50s, when it was a search for two numbers, it'll become the search for six numbers. That seems to me to be the worst... Uh, outcome we could expect. I think we can hope for something much better. Um, perhaps the tensions will become real. They'll become a real conflict. And the, the current front runner is the tension and the expansion rate. And the best way out of that is to replace lambda, the constant, by a dynamical uh, field. Right? We might see violation of the general relativity prediction for gravitational lensing with, the, with these uh, sort of instruments. That would be exciting. And I think the galaxy clusters are going to be particularly uh, powerful for this, for seeing if there are fifth forces, extra forces, acting in the dark sector. 
Maybe we'll see something unexpected in, in the structure. There's these hints of something called dark flows, peculiar velocities, a lot like what Donald and his crew were working on, but on much larger scales. Now, we don't take them super seriously, but if those can be done, these are done using something called the uh, kinetic sunyayev zoldovich effect after Rashid here, uh, and I think that I'm certainly looking forward to what will come out of that. Maybe we'll see something weird in the structure, non-Gaussianity or anomaly. Something that worries me there is I go to meetings, everyone is talking about the same statistic. You've got to measure the bispectrum. It's, maybe that's a good thing to do. Maybe we're being blinkered. I don't know. Maybe we'll see new light on dark matter. I'm sure Joe's going to talk about this. People are trying to detect the dark matter, but they haven't done it yet. The, it, WIMPs are very popular, but the window's closing. Axions are very well motivated, but haven't been detected. One thing that I like is fuzzy dark matter. I have to admit it's much well less motivated. But it has one good thing going for it, that we're either going to rule it out in the next decade for sure, or we'll be able to pretty well convincingly show it, it, it's true. And one of the ways we can rule it out is using a recent discovery in gravitational lensing. Here's a cartoon of how we see uh, multiple images of things using the natural telescope of a cluster of galaxies. It turns out if the dark matter in those clusters is this fuzzy dark matter, it's granular. What the observers have measured is they have seen individual stars being microlensed by the dark matter. And the way that happens is super sensitive to the nature of the dark matter. So if this theory is right, I think this kind of observation uh, will fix it. And then finally, maybe we'll have a new theoretical idea. You know, technology has been marching very fast. Right? Astronomy is ridden on the coattails of the military industry who've developed fantastic detectors that we've been able to use where every decade we've got orders of magnitude increase uh, in power. Moore's law in computing keeps up with that. Right? Ideas are very infrequent. Right? It's Newton in the 17th century. Right? It's, it's French people in the 18th century. It's Maxwell and Boltzmann in the 19th century. And then it's Einstein and quantum mechanics in the 20th century, which is about 80, you know, 90 years ago. So I think there's reasonable hope looking at that periodicity that we're a little bit overdue uh, for another surprise. So thank you for your time. <laughs> sure if we have time for questions. <coughs> there you go. Oh, yes. And it's all right. Okay, um, so I thought I would um, give you a slightly complimentary view to um, what you heard from Nick. I was going to start off with some personal anecdotes about how I began in research, and you could consider this as advice for the next generation. So this is how um, things were very useful to me. Okay, so how did things begin for me? Well, 
I would say one rule is that um, you need more than just intuition um, to be a cosmologist. And here is a classic example of um, Fred Hoyle, who had wonderful intuition. Um, he basically, uh, you know, realized the steady state universe in this intuition. Uh, we know he was wrong. Um, and here's another example of the great Russian cosmologist, Yakov Zeldovich. So before the discovery of the microwave background, he conjectured the universe was cold and um, therefore it, it was unstable to fragmentation where it expanded and this gave him uh, a theory of galaxy formation. So he was excited by that. But the interesting thing about Zeldovich is that when the data did come along very soon after, he immediately switched horses. My advisor at Harvard, David Laser, did not. And this was actually wonderful for me because I could test my ideas against, against his and um, that was a, a great foil. And of course the person who had the most intuition of all was George Gamow and um, his work was largely forgotten um, until um, you know, the discovery of the microwave background. Okay, so you need more than intuition. Another rule I would say is that you have to get the timing right. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And so um, I was a graduate student um, soon after this, um, uh, the Bell Telephone Labs had, had an antenna that was uh, not used for, for any uh, satellite communication. They gave it to Penzias and Wilson who uh, discovered the microbe background. And so I was a graduate student in 1964 and this was ideal because suddenly one had a, a whole new um, uh, area of unexplored results in cosmology. So this is where I was at the time. Um, um, this is Harvard, Harvard College Observatory. I had an office somewhere in the basement. And um, I spent happy years there working on the formation of the galaxies. So let me sort of tell you what made a major difference to my life there. I attended a summer school um, in my first long summer there um, on, um, at Woods Hole on oceanographic fluid, astrophysical and oceanographic fluid dynamics. And you can probably see in this figure there are some very uh, famous um, uh, cosmologists. Um, let's see, um, over here you see George Field. Um, uh, Alar Tumri, um, Peter Goldreich is, is somewhere there too. And so all of, these, all of these amazing people were basically giving the students summer projects. So I, I lucked onto a good one. Um, there I am in the front row and um, spent the summer um, working on the diffusion of photons in the expanding Big Bang. And um, I managed to um, get this paper out um, with, uh, w within a few months fluctuations in the primordial fireball, predicting that if the theory of gravitational stability was right, that is, if, if objects formed by gravity in the early universe, one should leave, even though it happened a long time ago, one should leave traces behind in the macro background, tiny fluctuations that would be witness to this. And um, incidentally, this was in the days when um, uh, research of graduate students was actually supported by, by the US Air Force. Standards were really different then. Um, I'm not sure what they why they cared about cosmology, I suspect it was more the mathematics that was involved, but anyway, so that was my um, contract as a graduate student. Okay, so um, another uh, example that I learned uh, fairly early, I, I don't, I mean, you've seen examples of beautiful simulations of large scale structure. And so it's, uh, that Nick showed you. So it's true that color is an amazing extra dimension. So now I, was not that great a fan of computers, but this was my, um, my attempt early on to understand how galaxies formed in the context of what we called um, cold dark matter. And, um, and so the black line in the center is how fluctuations are, um, are, are growing and, and all the red, red lines are areas where structure can form galaxies. And there are many types of, of galaxies there. Um, and so this was, um, this, this is a project. okay, this one if you want to call sure, it. thanks, right, okay. And so this was a, a, a wonderful um, uh, way of connecting um, observational data and the simplest theory of, um, so or, or as things evolve from, um, from, from right to left, as gravity became more important, 
one suddenly had these fluctuations peeling off to make galaxies. And then on the larger scales, they, um, they were not gravitationally very important to make stars anyway, and one had clusters and groups. So this was a very simplistic idea. And to show you the, uh, an example of how simple the physics is, so on the bottom right, you see the atomic physics cooling curve, hydrogen helium in a plasma. And the inverse of that gives you the rate of dissipation of the plasma. And all that is is gives you the reflection of this curve, which contains all the data. And much of what we see today probably is not too grossly uh, different from this. OK, so here's another lesson, I would say. Uh, it's important to choose a new field, ideally interdisciplinary, um, where there's a gap to be bridged. And so, um, uh, so I was very interested in areas with the new experiments to be developed, new theories to be defined. And in those days, galaxy formation and um, dark matter were certainly two of the outstanding problems. Um, that was then. We haven't solved those yet. And now not much has changed, but we can add dark energy and uh, polarization of the microwave background as two new areas where we really totally lack um, any strong uh, theoretical understanding. OK, um, so that's the end of my um, retrospective reflections on, on my career. Now let me, I'm now going to jump forward and tell you about where I think the future of cosmology is going. Um, and let me sort of begin with, with dark matter. OK, so um, we have these amazing experiments now. Um, so this shows you examples of um, experiments deep underground in mines where you look for dark matter particles, which are weakly interacting. They penetrate the detectors. They scatter them. They should give you some recoil energy. We don't see anything. Um, we look in um, very faint galaxies, dim dwarf galaxies. The dark matter particles should occasionally give you a gamma ray photon. If they annihilate with themselves, which the current theory says they probably should, we don't see that at all. Uh, and then finally, um, here is where the, um, the, um, the real big powers are, at the, at the LHC, Large Hadron Collider. There we collide particles together and try to make uh, dark matter particles, essentially because of it, they have missing energy or, or, or missing momentum, and that, that would tell you something dark was created. Um, by conservation of energy momentum. So we haven't seen anything there either. So it, it's very, very frustrating. So the upshot is that um, theorists become incredibly ingenious. So let me tell you about um, one direction that um, I've been going in. And that direction is called primordial black holes. So now the beauty of this as dark matter is that we've measured black holes. We're not inventing new physics to make black holes. We saw a beautiful example um, a couple of months ago with the Event Horizon Telescope, so we know they exist. And if there are enough of them, especially smaller ones, they're an ideal candidate for dark matter. Uh, and the reason for that is um, if I make them very early, then as the universe radiation redshifts away, I'm suddenly left with this, uh, with this essentially component of, of black holes, which would be very important gravitationally and could be all the dark matter. And so we now are at a state where we are trying to set limits on this hypothesis. And um, because these black holes do exert uh, effects on stars, and so we're trying very hard now to eliminate all possibilities. So we do have one remarkable window for, for primordial black holes, which is roughly the mass of an asteroid. Okay, so um, amazingly, these are produced by inflation models if you go early enough. And there could easily be enough of them. And these are not ruled out by any experiments which come in for the more massive black holes, because the more massive black holes will perturb galaxies, give you too much lensing of background stars, whatever. But these are safe. And so that, to me, is intriguing. Known physics, nothing new. On the other hand, um, there's another school of thought in the dark matter community that is motivated more by particle physics. And so this, um, this shows you um, the parameter space that they work in. And so what you have to realize is that th these are all possibilities for dark matter, weakly interacting dark matter particles. And I have enormous uncertainty in the range of masses and the range of interaction strengths. And um, it's a little bit like um, you know, when you lose your car keys in, at night in the forest, you, 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 go to see where, 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 you know, you, you, you go to see where there's a light, a light pole or something, and you look for them. Uh, maybe you'll find them, maybe you won't. But so we're only looking in tiny preferred areas of this uh, possibly almost infinite parameter space, and we haven't found any dark matter candidates yet. 
Um, so the question keeps on being asked, oh, have we run out of candidates? And the answer is actually no, um, because this shows you what we call um, the WIMP window. So the WIMP is the name for weakly directly massive particles. And um, th th this is a range that's strongly favored by theory. It could give you gamma rays. We haven't seen them yet. But there's this huge triangular window that over the next few years, we will gradually fill up and look for these these events. So that, there's a whole interesting range of activity there to look for dark matter. Okay, um, so it's far from dead as a field, but we have to keep on looking, I would say, and maybe the primordial black hole is one of our greatest clues. So now let me um, turn to dark energy. And again, this is a fascinating story. Let me give you the history first. Um, so in Einstein's uh, field equations, um, he made initially the, the big step of inducing a constant to balance the experimental universe. That's this lambda term. Subsequent people, notably Lemaitre, stuck it on the right-hand side as a source of essentially acceleration of the universe. So let's go straight to Lemaitre. So this is truly amazing. So in 1934, this was around the birth of quantum mechanics. Lemaitre, who had... Um, all of these um, theories for, in his notebook for the expanding universe accelerating, he conjectured that the energy of the vacuum was just quantum fluctuations. Okay, exactly the, the, the modern theory we have now with an equation of state, um, that essentially constant negative pressure, and one that in fact would give you um, suitable uh, acceleration. So this was amazing. Um, and Einstein poo-pooed these ideas very strongly, but the great thing about Einstein was when he showed Einstein some data he would change his mind very quickly. And so within a couple of years, he and Hubble pose at Mount Wilson, and Einstein says, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation I've ever listened to. Okay, so, um, so Lemaitre is very much with us, um, his ideas, but of course, we haven't got very far in the sense that um, his prediction was that P equals minus rho, that was the simple prediction for dark energy, and in the early days, this is one of the first experiments, so um, this parameter that's plotted here, W, is just this minus one, um, and you can see there are huge error bars um, as a function of, um, of matter, okay? Um, and this was from the early data of Saul Perlmutter, Perlmutter, one of the papers that merited the Nobel Prize uh, from data at that time. But the amazing thing is, is we now fast forward to the latest data um, this is what perturbs many of us in cosmology. Uh, all this amazingly accurate data zeroes in again on minus one. There is no indication of any evidence for any, um, any new physics, okay? Um, which you would expect if, if there was some deviation here, if, if these different constraints from um, lensing and dark matter and supernovae did not exactly all, all coincide. So um, this is a little bit worrying to... Um, when you try to forecast the future. So at some point you have to decide these experiments are where we are, 2019, but at some point we're gonna design much more powerful experiments. Um, you know, at what point should we um, hope that they will find something different or, or be, you know, just accept the fact that they may only confirm um, um, dark energy even more closely in the future. Okay. Um, so that's my story on dark energy. And now let me tell you a bit about the microwave background. So this also is a, an amazing story. You saw these, these um, fluctuations, the fossils from the beginning, which em, embed our cosmic history um, uh, in the past and uh, since led to galaxy formation. So it's interesting that the, the two best experiments to date, um, WMAP and Planck, had, you know, tens or hundreds of detectors, and they had a certain amount of sensitivity, millionths of a Kelvin. Kel remember, this temperature is at two, three degrees Kelvin. So we're looking at variations of parts in a million. Um, but to really go further, you have to do a thousand times better. This is to look for this um, elusive polarization signal, which is one of the predictions of the, of, of, of the inflation theory. So um, there are many experiments then being designed now to add more and more detectors and therefore getting more and more sensitivity, right? And so then you can go below a microkelvin to fractions of that. And so in the immediate future, we have Lightbird, the satellite just approved, 
Uh, we have the Simons Observatory uh, under preparation, CMB Stage 4 about to, about to be funded. We, we hear balloons too. So all of these are designed to, to really probe um, this elusive signal which comes from inflation. However, there is a slight problem with this, and that is um, there's no robust guarantee of any signal because um, we don't actually know uh, when after inflation occurred, when the universe reheated, and the amount, the strength of the polarization signal that is predicted that would be a direct test of inflation is highly uncertain. So um, now this simply means that one should keep on looking, devise better and better experiments, but it's fair to ask, is there another experimental strategy one could imagine using? So let me um, tell you a little about that in the final part of my talk. So most of these fields, dark matter, dark energy, they, sh they share something, no detection, uh, no lower bound. Um, we need accuracy, but also precision, and we, that's a whole issue. Um, the question is, what do we do next in cosmology? So let me try to give you an example here. Okay, so what you see in red is all the information we have from the cosmic microwave background. So this counts the number of modes um, in the sky. Okay, so basically, you can add up these modes. That maybe when you, the map of the microwave background sky I showed you had a, roughly a million pixels on it. And that means you have roughly a million modes. And, and that's the number, if I integrate under this red curve, the number of degrees of freedom. And so what that means is the limiting accuracy is 1 over square root of n which is, you know, pretty good, 0.1%. Um, but there's something else which I find incredibly more exciting, okay? So it may be that with this approach, we will be limited in how far we can go, but if you could ever go to the dark ages, okay, um, then you can look for gas clouds in absorption against the microwave background. Um, and there, because these clouds are very small, they're sort of millions of solar masses, suddenly I have many more modes, trillions of modes. And so what this means is, in principle, one can do incredibly accurate experiments if you go to what we call the dark ages, that is, before there are any stars, before there are any galaxies. So that's the question that we would like to explore. Uh, but it's incredibly difficult to do this. Um, and I'm going to show you a futuristic way of addressing this. Um, and so the idea is the following, that um, is there some prediction of inflation that we are sure has to be there? And so we, we, there is one, um, we, we call it primordial non-Gaussianity, that is non-random fluctuations. And so here's an example, two examples of random fluctuations, Gaussian and non-random. So the one on the left actually is of course um, um, the cosmic web, it, it's, it's a clustering. I mean, uh, we, we can explain the deviations from Gaussianity by this, by this little parameter in front of delta t over t, and it's of order thousands in those simulations. Um, but if you want to go, uh, um, but that's all foreground, so you have to dig deep into that to do better. And so ideally, um, to get to the inflationary signal, it's incredibly smaller. It's roughly speaking about 0.01 in, in, these, in these slightly bizarre units. So you have, you've got to do you know, 100,000 times better probably to get down there. And there's a robust prediction for this, depending on the um, properties of, of, of inflationary models, whether they're multi-field or single field, there's a whole literature on this. But basically, you're looking for a, a signature that's of order 0.01 in this tiny, tiny parameter. And the way you can hope to get that is if you have many trillions of modes because then 1 over root n is a wonderful thing. You can really beat things down. And you can never do this with um, large-scale structure surveys um, or CMB surveys, never quite get to this level of sensitivity. Now, obviously, one has to do everything um, to get there. Um, the current limits, FNL, of roughly 10. One has to improve this by an enormous factor. Okay, so how do you do this? So there's only one place um, in the solar system that um, this makes sense. Um, and this is something for the future. Um, and I would say it's going to involve something very futuristic. So let me summarize again. A million pixels on the CMB sky, 100 million independent pixels roughly in my dig biggest deep galaxy surveys. And suddenly, if I can go to the first clouds and look in the dark ages, I can get trillions of pixels. Okay? So in principle, by, by looking in this, uh, in this time, long before there were stars, right? 
Um, here is the, the, the last scattering migrate background. This is the first stars. So you go back early enough, which means you have to go to very, very high redshift. So you're talking about 21 centimeters. That's the wavelength of atomic hydrogen. And so to go back to this incredibly early epoch, we have to redshift this by, um, oh, it goes from 21 centimeters to something like 10 meters. Okay, very, very low frequency, 30 megahertz. Okay, so where can you do this? So there's only one place in the solar system where you can have a hope of doing this, and that's the far side of the moon, because this is the most radio quiet place in the entire inner solar system. And it's shielded um, from all the terrestrial interference. Maybe that will change as we explore the, the, the moon more in the future, but right now, um, the space stations are exploring ideas to do science on the moon. Um, and so here's a schematic sort of thing. So this sort of radio telescope is really low technology, basically, apart from the computing requirements. You basically lay down strips of printed dipoles over hundreds of kilometers over the, over the lunar surface, radio dipole antennae, and then uh, correlate the signal with, with, with satellites and send things back to Earth. Something like that is the idea people are thinking about. Okay, so this is a, just a concept at the moment. Um, here are one or two numbers. You can, in principle, by covering a huge area on the far side of the moon, hundreds of kilometers, have a resolution that um, is comparable or better than that of the, 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 the CMB, um, tens of inverse megaparsecs. Um, and, then, um, and then you need hundreds of kilometers. You need millions of these dipoles to get the sensitivity. Um, and you're, you're fighting against this really bright foreground from the galaxy, which is hugely bright, but you know it's 1,000 Kelvin or 10,000 Kelvin. You're looking for a 10 meter K signal. But that's, no, that's not so different from the early days of microwave background astronomy, when we began you know, with 3 degrees Kelvin, maybe a tenth of that in Penzias and Wilson, and now we're discussing nano Kelvin. So in principle, you know, one, if one's imaginative, one can imagine the future. And in fact, we are planning a dipole. This is the square kilometer array, which will have 100,000 antennae doing low frequency in 2025. This cannot be used for the moon very well because of the ionosphere of the Earth gives you too much noise. You ideally want to go to a, a more radio quieter place, but this shows you that we have the technology in place to do this. Okay, um, so my message really is back to the moon. Um, all this has changed in the past year because in January, the Chinese space agency landed um, uh, a satellite on the far side of the moon, soft landing, with a low frequency radio dipole. So you can see that on, on this. So, and they are busy taking data on the, on the beginning of the universe. Unfortunately, this was not the optimal satellite for various reasons, but they will do more. The Chinese never give up on these things. They're already planning some amazing experiments the next few years. Uh, meanwhile, the US wants to send astronauts back to the moon. Um, right now, there's a long way to go. Um, this is the current presence. But the intriguing thing is, um, why would you want to do this? Look at this amazing um, image from the Lunar Recon Reconnaissance Orbiter. And um, the Europe's space boss you know, says that, um, well, now's the time to build a lunar base. We'll have hotels in a lunar village, whatever. And you may say, this is absurdly expensive. But if you think about it, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Space Shuttle, they were, you know, um, five to ten, you know, the, the telescope was five to ten percent of the space station and space shuttle, I would say. So it was a small fraction of the total. And in, in some sense, doing science on the moon may be a small fraction of the cost of all the infrastructure that, that might be involved. So that's the message. Um, maybe in the future, ESA is now launching a call for proposals for the period 2035 to 2050, and we'll be definitely trying to persuade them that the loon is something they should be thinking about. Okay, so um, thank you. Um, many thanks, my postdocs, my students, um, and above all, my family for their support and patience. So over to you, thank you. If there's time, if there's questions for either Nick or me. Okay. Sorry? Okay. So I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll settle things there. Yeah. Okay.
congratulations again to our 2019 prize recipients. Thanks to everyone for being here, and do join us for our reception in the foyer. Thank you. You too. I didn't want to uh, try to have something different. So, spy these guys. Yeah. Don't forget your. Uh, yeah. Which which one is mine? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. Very nice jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, don't forget your medal. Right, absolutely, yeah. Paper